When a mother's child goes missing in China, she dedicates her life to finding the children of others. Two employees at a pizza parlor have a close encounter of the burned kind, as in pizza crust getting burned. And then we take a look at the stories that we hear of musicians being replaced with body doubles. Sounds ludicrous. But what happens when one of those body doubles comes forward to tell his side of the story? Today on Dead Rabbit Radio. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Dead Rabbit Radio. I'm your host, Jason Carpenter. I'm having a great day. I hope you guys are having a great day too. I hope you guys have some cool plans for the weekend. If not, I hope you guys are just staying cool inside. Because this all of a sudden is a radio show and this is my radio voice. Let's give a shout out to our newest Patreon, Marcus Clausen. Marcus, thank you so much for supporting the show. That really, really helps out a lot. You are going to be our navigator, our pilot today. If you can't support the Patreon, that's fine too. Just help get the word out about the show. You have no idea how much that helps. We also have a merch store you can purchase from. If you are a Patreon supporter, we're still sending out the stickers, so please send me your address. i got a whole new batch of these stickers to go out. It'll be awesome. These stickers are great. Marcus, let's go ahead and hop in the Dead Rabbit Dirigible. We're going to take a nice little slow journey. We're starting off in China. Now, it's the year 1988. We haven't got there yet. Actually, I forgot how slow the Dirigible is. We're going over the Great Blue Pacific Ocean. Now we're in China. Thanks, Marcus, for flying us over. We're in Xi'an, which is in the Shanxi province in China. It's 1988. There's a little little baby person. His name is Mao Yin. He's like walking around. His dad's walking down the street. He has his little baby. Now the little baby's like, well, I want some water, man. And the dad's like, that's weird. There's your first word was a whole sentence. And the dad turns around and goes, wait right here. I'm going to turn around for 30 seconds and grab you a water. Dad turns around, gets water, turns back around. Busy street. Everything's going, bicycles are running, cars are driving by. But the only thing that's important is Mao Yin. Every other thing becomes silent at once. His son is missing. Oh man, I can't even imagine that. Yesterday's episode I was talking about kids passing away. I think the only thing scarier than that would be a missing kid. So Mao Yin goes missing. I can't even imagine that. The mom, Li Jingzi, she quits her job looks for her son. She dedicates her life to finding her son. She starts an organization called Baby Come Home. Just the name of that. Like, that's like the saddest corporation ever. I don't think they were a corporation. I don't think they had a board of directors, but that's the saddest organization ever. Baby Come Home. Sounds like a Mariah Carey song. But it's not. It's not a song that she play on Valentine's Day over and over again. It's the name of Baby Missing Place. I mean, think about it. In America, we have the missing and exploited children. It gets the job done. It makes sense. You know what they're doing. Baby, come home. It's not that song, Baby, Come Back. It's it's real, and it's sad. Not like the song's not real. The song exists as well, but... Baby, come home. Because I don't want you gone. However the song goes. <laughs> I don't think it's about missing the Chinese children. But anyways. But Li Jingzi starts Baby, Come Home. And over the course of about 20 years... She hands out 100,000 flyers. Now, to be fair, I don't, think she, I don't think she handed them all out herself. I don't think she's like 999,000. 100,000. I think she probably... I also don't think she had like one giant stack. And she just handed it to someone. She goes, I've handed out 100,000 flyers. I think her company, her organization handed these out. Over the course of 20 years, though, she was able to take her own tragedy. She was able to help 29 other families get reunited with their children. So I thought it was an interesting story to highlight. I thought it was an interesting story to talk about that you could turn tragedy into a success. So, so Marcus, let's hop back in the Dead Rabbit Dirigible. We're going to head out to our next story. We're actually headed to... Wait, 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 wait. Turn off the Dirigible. Turn it off, turn it off. Wait, what's that? I'm getting, I'm getting something in my earpiece somewhere and all of a sudden... Wait, what? What? Oh, guys, breaking news. Breaking news. 300 miles away from where Mao Ying was kidnapped. In the city of Mianyang, there's a 34-year-old man named Gu Ningning. Just hanging out, doing his thing, drinking some coffee. Whatever he was doing on this particular day, 
Chinese police are like walking through the city. He's like, uh oh, I don't think I did anything wrong, but I'm super nervous that these cops are coming right towards me. And the cops come up to him and they're like, are you Mao Yin? And he goes, no, I'm Gu Ningning, 34 years old. I don't know who this Mao Yin guy is. And the police are like, we think, I think we need to introduce you to somebody. So what happened was the police were always investigating this. Now, of course, you know, there's a bunch of people, there's a bunch of crimes in cities and stuff like that, but the story was already floating around, but nobody, I mean, a missing two-year-old kid, that's not a case you're just like, oh, whatever, I'm going to I'm gonna go investigate this mugging instead. That'll always be in the back of your head. They start to hear stories. Local authorities start to hear story that in Mean Yang, there was a family that bought a baby back in the 80s. Police are like, that's interesting. <laughs> First off, that's a crime. We should investigate that. But I wonder if it's related to this little kid that went missing 300 miles away. They took a photograph of Mao Yin, did an age progression on it to modern time 2020, and then ran it through the government database, their facial recognition database, which, I mean, police states are absolutely horrible. But even in a police state, you can have some good things come out of it. A broken clock is right twice a day. They have photographs and cameras everywhere. And they were able to take this age-progressed photo, and they caught Gu Ningning walking through his hometown, drinking coffee, whatever he's doing, and the police go, I bet you that's Mao Yin. There's a YouTube video of Mao Yin, now Gu Ningning, meeting his mother for the first time since 1988. And she's just in tears He's in tears. The dad's like, <laughs> the dad's drinking water. He's like, I haven't drank in water since you went missing, but now I can take the swig. I felt so guilty. The dad, the mom is just, so, you'll be a little choked up as well. Since 1988, little baby. And she had this great quote. I would like to thank the tens of thousands of people who helped us. I can't believe that after helping 29 missing children find their families, I am able to find my own son. Now, what's interesting is the family that purchased him at the time this article was published, the Chinese authorities don't think that they knew the child was kidnapped. They did pay $845, the equivalent of $845 US dollars for the kid. They believe that that family actually thought it was like an adoption fee. Like they didn't think that they were implicit. And Mao Yin says, I don't know what I'm going to do now. Like I have a, like I definitely am super grateful that I found my birth mother and my birth father. But there I go, so what city are you going to live in? And he's like, I, I don't know. Like, this, this is, I didn't even know I was, kid I didn't even know he was kidnapped. I didn't even know I was adopted, really. And I find out I'm adopted and I was kidnapped at the same time. So, but it's a beautiful story, right? Never stop fighting for that. Never stop fighting for that find. I mean, it worked for the Forest Finn people, right? They kept on believing that treasure existed, despite the fact that I didn't. And they were right. So if you think that's out there, keep going for it. Keep fighting. They found that little baby. He was an adult. Beautiful story. Beautiful story. I recommend a video will be in the show notes. It's just a really emotional thing. So thank you so much for flying us out there, Marcus. Now we can fire up that Dead Rabbit Dirigible. We're leaving behind China. We're headed out to Scotland. We're headed out to Newtown. That's in Edinburgh, Scotland. Now I know Stuart Meatball always tries to correct my Scotland name pronunciations that's the word i'm looking for but i think even though he's from scotland i think he's wrong unless i'm pronouncing that right and then he's totally right edinburgh edinburgh whatever we're going to newtown and this was reported in a magazine called ufo scotland i got it from think about it docs.com a great website so we're gonna land that dirigible we're going to go for a walk. Dude, finding babies really makes me hungry. It also makes me thirsty. We're going to get some water. But it really makes me hungry. Look, there's a little pizza parlor here. Ding, ding. Ding, ding. We walk through the door of this pizza parlor. And there's this dude. His name is Brian Wilson. Not the Beach Boys Brian Wilson. Is there a guy on the Beach Boys named Brian Wilson? That name sounds familiar. But we go and we're going to sit down at our little booth. And we ordered some pizzas. I'm going to get an all-meat pizza. Because that sounds delicious right now. You can order whatever you want. Marcus is paying for it. Patreon money. You know how it works. Sit down. Uh, you're not getting any of my pizza. <laughs> We're eating pizza. Now, Brian Wilson tells this story. One night he's working at the pizza parlor. And two, quote unquote, rather small adults walk in. It's a man and a woman. Now, he's not specific on what it constitutes rather small. But 
I'm, we'll say five feet. We'll say unusually small people. But they have an explanation for why they're five feet tall. They walk up to Brian Wilson and they each raise their right hand and say at the same time, Hi, we're Americans. As if that is supposed to answer why they're five feet tall. Now, he also noticed as they were walking up to the counter, they had a, they looked, quote, lopsided. I've no, I've been puzzled about what that means. Does that mean they were kind of hobbling? Does that mean their faces were actually like Picasso paintings? I don't know. Maybe it's a Scottish term. Maybe Stuart Meatball can fill us in. Maybe it's a Scottish term saying they looked weird. But for whatever reason, he said they looked lopsided and they were quite small. They walk up to the counter and they both raise their right hand and they go, Hi, we're Americans. And he's like, oh, this is kind of weird. I've met a lot of Americans. Like, I'm from Scotland, but we do get Americans here from time to time. They're normally not tiny. They normally don't speak in unison. And they're normally not lopsided. So he goes, what would you like? And the dude, the man is speaking now, he goes, what do you make? And Brian's kind of like, <laughs> looks over. his giant picture of a pizza. Looks over on the wall. There's a poster of a man eating a pizza. He's standing in front of a counter of pizza ingredients. And he goes, uh, pizzas is, is what we make, sir. We make, <laughs> if you look at the artwork on the wall, we, we make pizzas. And the man looks over at the woman and then looks up at Brian Wilson and goes, what are pizzas? What? Brian Wilson's like, okay, this is, maybe these guys are from America, right? I've heard a lot about that American public education system. So anyways, Brian Wilson starts making pizzas and they want tomato and cheese pizzas, which sounds disgusting, dude. I would, I would burn a pizza parlor down before I had a pizza that just had slices of tomato on it. But anyways, these Americans, these so-called Americans, are watching him intently make these pizzas. Putting down the sauce, putting on the cheese, and the people are just staring at him. They'd also kind of look around, looking around at everything. And he said that they're just staring at everything. They're t- he, he said it seemed like they had never been in a pizza parlor before. And the woman points at the green peppers. So they have, if you have never been into a pizza parlor before, generally they have all the toppings laid out behind a, so you can see the toppings, but you can't touch them yourself. The woman points to the green peppers and go, what are those? And at this point, Brian Wilson's co-worker came up, another member of the Beach Boys comes up. It's Tom Cruise from the Kokomo video, walks up. That's an old reference. Kokomo walks up. And now they're looking at each other. And they're like, what? The co-worker's like, what in the world? She doesn't know what a green pepper is. And Brian's kind of shaking his head like, dude, don't say anything. These guys are kind of weird. He doesn't say that. But that is the, that is the implication by the, the eye look. And she goes, what are these? And Brian goes, those, those are green peppers. And she's like, what's a green pepper? So Brian has to explain to this woman what a green pepper is. And he explains what it is. And then she goes, do they taste nice? And he's like, yeah, yeah, they taste pretty good. And so I would like some green peppers on my pizza. So they put green peppers on the pizza. They got the cheese, the tomatoes, the pepper, the green peppers on it and all that stuff. And then the aliens each ordered a pizza. And I guess I jumped the gun right. They're aliens. Basically, if you didn't get that already, the implication is they're aliens. They each get a pizza. And Brian Wilson's standing there with his co-worker, and the two people, aliens, they each open up their pizza box. Take a bite of pizza. Walk outside, throw the pizzas in the garbage can, and just walk away. So the implication, and he goes on to say, you know, I've always heard about aliens trying to act like human beings, to kind of pretend. He goes, that's what it felt like. It felt like people had seen how humans acted, but we're doing a really bad job of it. So it's possible that these were just two normal lopsided Americans visiting Scotland, having a good time, but it had never been to a pizza parlor before, right? That's possible. But it's possible that Brian Wilson and his co-worker didn't get abducted. They got abducted. <laughs> they got abducted. No, oh, never mind, cut. Okay, so I just tried thinking of a, <laughs> I just tried thinking of a pizza pun for five minutes and I couldn't think of any. But I will end it with this. I think it should all be agreed that round table pizza is one hundred percent, hands down, the best pizza out there. I think we should agree on that. DiGiorno 
is the best pizza you can buy in the freezer section. So send me free pizzas to Jarno and Roundtable Pizza. You send me some coupons and stuff like that or whatever whatever you do. They just send me a pizza with green peppers. No tomatoes, so disgusting. Let's go ahead, Marcus. Let's hop in that carpenter copter. We're bringing my pizza. You guys can bring your pizza too. Marcus has to pay the bill. I always love it when we charge the Patreon people more money. I'm like, what? Get a bunch of chargebacks. It doesn't matter. I've already eaten my food. Marcus, let's hop in that carpenter copter. We are headed out to Hollywood. Dun 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 Okay, that's enough for copyright violation. Helicopter. It's like 1980s, dude. We're wearing, I'm wearing like a white suit with a pink shirt. We're looking slick, bro. Musical montages all the way along. Hot chicks, bikinis. Mountains of cocaine. We're not doing that. <laughs> we're not, we're, I'm pulling you away from the cocaine. We don't use drugs on this show, bro. What are you thinking about? Dun 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 dun. Copyright violation. Can't do that. <laughs> push away the cocaine. Push away the, the copyrighted music. We're flying now. The carbon copter is neon pink. Neon pink carbon copter. Everything is looking slick. We're gonna land in LA. We're gonna land in an intersection. Cars are stopping. What are they gonna do? Look how cool we're dressed. They can't say nothing to us. We're wearing slacks and no socks. And penny loafers. We walk into a dive bar. And on stage, there's a dude. He's playing the guitar. <laughs> that sounds like a hillbilly. We're not in Tennessee. <laughs> he's playing the guitar. And it's 1983. And there's a guy sitting in the corner taking shots of Jack. He's watching this dude on stage play guitar with a band. He's not just up there. He's the custodian. He's like, well, on my breaks, I like to stand on stage and play guitar. He's in a band, and this guy's playing guitar, and in the corner, there's a dude sitting there shooting back shots at Jack. And after the show, he walks up to the guitarist, and he introduces himself. Hey, my name's Mick Mars. You might know who I am, and if you don't know who I am, you know who I'm affiliated with. A little band known as Motley Crue. That, that, that guitar strum happens whenever someone says Motley Crue. And the dude's like, yeah, I have heard of you guys. You guys rock. I heard you guys recently just had an album come out in 1981 called Too Fast for Love. As, as the guitarist is looking at his notes. Yeah, that's true. We did have that. Now, I have a question for you. Can you play bass? <laughs> Flash forward, and you have this man. His name is Matthew John Tripp. He recently left Erie, Pennsylvania. He wanted to make it big in Hollywood. He wanted to be a rock star, right? So he goes to goes to L.A., joins the music scene. But now he's sitting in a recording booth with Mick Mars and the rest of the band Motley Crue. And here's what happened. They recorded their album, Too Fast for Love, and their bassist, Nikki Six, got in a car accident afterwards. And he injured his shoulder, which you kind of need when you're playing a bass. And he also had a little bit of a heroin problem, so it's not a good combination of stuff. Like, even if his arm's in a sling, I'm sure... Dude, Def Leppard had a drummer with one arm. I'm sure you can figure out how to play bass with uh, your arm in a sling with an injured shoulder. But the heroin addiction is not helping things, right? So they have this idea. Motley Crue have an idea. Probably the last time I'm going to do that. Jokes always work better in threes. <laughs> and then after that, it gets old. They have an idea. What we need to do is we need to capitalize on this success. We need to keep Motley Crue. We're not doing that again. We need to keep Motley Crue together, but we can't do it with this guy. But Nikki Six is a good friend of ours, so let's get a new. Nikki Six. They had Matthew John Tripp start signing contracts, but he had to sign it under the name Nikki Six. They took him to get all of Nikki Six's matching tattoos. And when he's running with Motley Crue, he starts writing songs for them. He actually writes some of their biggest songs. Now, I'm not a big hair metal band. I like Poison. I like Poison a lot. White Snake's pretty good. Um, I never really listened to much Motley Crue, but honestly, like, obviously, when you think of Motley Crue, you think of girls, girls, girls. It's the only part of that song I know. Or, shout, shout, shout at the devil. So that that's it. I only know the lyrics that are titles of their songs. I remember once they got cornered by a Christian group for writing satanic music, and I thought it was such a cop-out answer. One of them, I don't remember who it was. could have been Matthew John Tripp said, Oh, no, no, we're saying shout at the devil because we don't like him either. And I remember thinking, guys, you can't have it both. <laughs> you can't have it both ways, right? You either just take the heat 
and just be like, yeah, what are you going to do about it? Or don't, oh, no, 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 you don't get it. We're shouting at him because he's a loser and we're praising the Lord. Like, uh, anyways, anyways, that has nothing to do with the story. I just thought it was an interesting anecdote. The original Nikki Six, Frank Ferrana, is overcoming his heroin addiction and recouping. Matthew John Tripp, a.k.a. Nikki Six, is signing all these contracts. He's helping to write some of their biggest songs during their formative period. Now, he works on Shout of the Devil album. He works on their album Shout of the Devil. He works on their album Theater of Pain. And they go on tour, and he's playing live. Now, remember the band had just started to become big. And we're in the 1980s. We don't have internet photos. We don't have, like, these huge fan bases that are constantly putting gifts of Motley Crue playing over and over again. It's just, you see them live, they're a brand new band, maybe you see some pictures of them in a thrash or trash or junk or whatever magazine was profiling the scene at that time, and that's it. So it would be pretty easy to pull this off. In April of 1984, he gets kicked out of the band. Matthew John Tripp gets kicked out of the band, and they bring the original Nikki Six back. He flo- Matthew John Tripp floats in and out of jail for a while. He actually ends up in a mental health facility. And, he- and so let me tell you this right now. What he's saying, if you haven't caught on already, is that he was repl- he was a replacement for Nikki Six. He actually was a formative member of the band, and he was kicked out. At this point, Motley Crue is a huge band. At this point. And he's going to jail, and he's like, you know, I used to be in Motley Crue. I was Nikki Six for a couple of years. And people are like, what? Like, why are you in this prison in Florida? And he's like, that's a long story. And he'd tell the story, and people would be like, this guy's nuts, but it kind of makes sense. Kind of make like he would he would weave this tale. Now, again, this wasn't the days of Twitter. You couldn't ask. You couldn't just tweet, hey, at Motley Crew, what do you think of this stuff? They have no idea this is going on. That this guy in mental health facility is saying, hey, look at you saw that photo of Nikki Six and this kid. At this point, they are on MTV. They're a very big band. Look at I have the same tattoos. They made me get these tattoos. He did have the same tattoos. You saw him and you're like, what? I guess he could kind of be Nikki Six. But while he's floating in and out of jail, he's in a mental health facility from time to time. He's still getting contacted. He's saying Mick Mars and other people associated with Motley Crue. I'm so glad I gave it that gimmick of the guitar riff are still contacting him to write songs, because he wrote great songs, right? He says, I'm still getting calls from Mick Mars, I'm still part of the band, but they're just not giving me credit. He says that he worked on 1987, the 1987 album, Girls, Girls, Girls. He said that he wrote that song. So again, all this stuff is going on. Now, on March 12th, 1988, there's a UK rock magazine called Kerrang! And they run a piece on this. This is really the first time that Motley Crue says they've ever heard of this, is this magazine article. And it shows pictures of Matthew John Tripp and pictures of Nikki Six. So they would go, here's a picture of Nikki Six today. Here's a picture of Nikki Six in 1983, when Matthew John Tripp said he was in the band. Now, based on our estimations, this version's taller. This version's eye color is different. This version has a different belly button. They're analyzing the belly buttons of these two pictures. Now, what's interesting is we see these conspiracy theories today. Avril Lavigne, she died in a car accident. This is a body double at some college student or something like that. You have them with uh, John or who was it? Paul is dead. Paul, was it? Who? Which one of them? Supposed to die in the car accident and got replaced with Billy Mays or Billy Shears or something like that in the Beatles. Katy Perry. Katy Perry's supposed to be Jean Benet Ramsey. That's some other stupid thing. But you'll get these. Miley Cyrus was killed. She was replaced with a clone. We did that episode a long time ago. Hey, Miley. And then we have this, but it's always someone kind of inventing it. This is the body double pushing the story. This is the body, which I hadn't come across this before. This is the body double saying, this is real. This is 100% real. I was the body double. I was used to keep the band going, and then they kicked me out, but I'm still writing songs. So you have the rock magazine Kerrang! expose this story. And they're kind of like, eh, this may be true, it may not be true, and stuff like that. But now Motley Crue's on the spot. They kind of have to address this, right? And they're like, of course not. Nikki Six goes, it was really weird because I'd be on tour. I was kind of doing my thing. And every so often a journalist would start asking me, so did you hear about that guy who says he's you? And he goes, can you imagine like, you're, you're you or I'm me. 
I'm me. And then I got people saying that they're me and they got matching tattoos. Like, he was flummoxed by the whole thing. He goes, no, 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 I'm Nikki Six. This is some guy. If you look at his, like, he's been in and out of jail. He's been to mental health facilities. I mean, it's a juicy story, right? It's a ju- I'm covering it 20 years later, 30 years later. It's a juicy story. So is there any proof to this other than photographs? Like, obviously, the Avril Lavigne thing. It's like, oh, look at she has a different nose 20 years later. Oh, no, look at these. She has wrinkles by her eyes. I think they call crow's feet. What? She didn't have those when she was 19. Must be a body double. So is there anything else other than the photographs? Well, again, he was telling the story all the time. Tripp got a speeding ticket while he was in Florida. He had family in Florida. So after he left L.A., he went to Florida. He got a speeding ticket in Florida, and he would have a copy of this speeding ticket. Because it was a piece of evidence. On the speeding ticket, so he's driving a Lamborghini, right? This guy who's been in and out of jail. He's living with his mom in Florida. He's driving a Lamborghini. He gets pulled over by the police. On the ticket, it's written out to Nikki Six and the car's registration, because it says on the ticket who the car's registered to. It's registered to Mick Mars. It's possible that the ticket's forged or that the cop was in on it. The guy's like, hey, you want to want to give me some evidence for this scam I'm running? Or some officer in the Florida Highway Patrol pulled over a Lamborghini for speeding, wrote a ticket with the available information he had, i.e. a guy who had a driver's license that said Nikki Six and the registration of the car belonging to Mick Mars, a member of Motley Crue. He joined a band. He joined an existing band. And he was already infamous at this point for saying that he was the real Nikki Six or the one who was on most of the albums. Not that he never claimed to be the original Nikki Six, just that he was the replacement. He was continuing to write music for him. He joined this existing band, and the band changed their name to the Six Pack to capitalize off this. And this this guy had this quote. I got this from an article um, in UltimateClassicRock.com. I have this article on this. I got this uh, quote here. This was from Roger Hemond who was in the group Six Packs. He could at times be very convincing, and to this day, I don't know whether or not anything he said was true. I've seen copyright forms processed by the Library of Congress that had every member of Motley Crue's full name, a.k.a. name, and social security number, with the exception of Nikki Six. All it said was Nikki Six and gave a social security number, which, I swear to God, was the same number on Matthew John Tripp's social security card which I was holding in my other hand. That's a long con. He has people all the way up. He has people in the Library of Congress. Now, what's interesting is Roger Hemmond said, he goes to the beginning, I, I, to this day, I don't know whether or not he said anything was true. He said the dude could not write songs for nothing, and he sucked. And he goes, what was miserable about being in the band is I was writing the songs, but we had to give him, Nikki Six, the credit, or Matthew John Tripp, the credit for writing the songs so people would think, oh, look at the, he really was. He was like, I was part of this con. Like, my art was being you. So Roger Hemmond did not think he wrote the songs that he said he wrote. But was he in the band? Was he a placeholder for Nikki Six? And then did he lie and make himself a bigger part of the band? He, who knows? Matthew John Tripp eventually ended up suing Motley Crue for money. Basically, for the the profits he should be owed for these songs. Now, Molly Cruz management says it was no big deal. It was thrown out of court. The court realized it was a stupid lawsuit. He lost, but that's not true. He did lose. Court case did not go forward. But it was a statute of limitations thing. The court never ruled on whether or not there was any proof to it. They just said that he waited too long. It's been too long. In 2014, Matthew John Tripp unfortunately passed away up until the end, swearing that he was Nikki Six and he helped the band in its formative days and he deserved credit and financial compensation for his work. But he passed away and the story is pretty much ended there. Or has it? This is interesting. This was a quote I came across. This was, I believe, this I got this from. UltimateClassicRock.com, an article called Satanism, Car Crashes, and Belly Buttons, The Curious Case of the Nikki Six Imposter. So it's from that article. I recommend reading it. It's really interesting. It ties this whole story into Michael Aquino. He was the guy who formed the Temple of Set. He actually believed Matthew John Tripp was Nikki Six at some time. So he had some pretty high backers. It wasn't just drunks and bars who were like, yeah, yeah, I knew him. Everyone he talked to really walked away thinking he might be telling the truth. Like it could be fake. But I have a feeling that he's telling the truth. But I found this interesting. This is how we're going to end this. Because I actually read this and I go, that's not true. That's not. That's impossible. That's not true. 
it's not true in 2020, definitely. It might have been true when this article was written, but it's definitely not true now. It's true. Let me read you this. While working on the songs that would become the Smash album, Dr. Feelgood. I know that song, too. Dr. Feelgood, gonna make you feel real nice. While working on the songs that would become the Smash album, Dr. Feelgood, the band demoed a track titled Say Yeah that didn't make the final cut. Years later, it appeared on the Odds and Ends collection, Supersonic and Demonic Relics, and is purportedly about Trip. With lines like, quote, You may have been raised by the skin of your teeth, but you got no originality, unquote. And, quote, If you don't sue us, what's your use? Everyone else has, unquote. Interestingly, it's one of the only crew songs not to have any set of complete lyrics available anywhere. And that is true. To this day, you cannot find the full lyrics to that song. It is a demo. You can't really hear what they're saying. People believe that was their song trashing Matthew John Tripp. Now, you could say maybe they're just trashing a guy because he's making these false claims. But other people are saying, no, it was their way of getting back at someone who was coming very, very close to exposing what they were doing. And to this, you, you, look look for the lyrics. L- I Look for the lyrics. I was looking for the lyrics. Like, you go to the YouTube and people are like, hey, did anyone ever get the lyrics for this? I was trying, I've been working on the lyrics and I can't figure it out. To this day, in the modern... I keep saying in the earlier, well, people didn't have Twitter. People didn't have the internet. To this day, with all of those tools, there does not exist a complete list of lyrics for this song. The song that could expose the truth. Hit bands are truly one in a million. It's incredibly hard to become successful. That's why when you have a band pop up seemingly out of the blue and they take the culture by storm, you just keep putting out albums until the fans turn their backs to you. It's the reason why Chris Pratt is in one movie and then he's in every movie. Because it's so hard to cut through the chaos, to cut through the white noise of society. So if you have a band that's able to do it, And then one of their members stumbles and falls. You can do a couple things. You can wait. But you got to strike where that iron's hot, right? Right now is the time they're crying out for Motley Crue. Will they care in two years? Two months? Who knows? You can quit. Just call it a day and say, you know what? We can't do the music without Nikki. Or you can do the impossible. You can do something that has been rumored over and over again. You can find someone who looks like Nikki. Give him matching tattoos. Strap a bass to him. Put him on stage. This was hair rock. So any facial differences can be covered up. Print the hair just right. Slather it with makeup. There's no close-up camera shots. There's no YouTube drones flying around. You're on stage. Maybe you'll get a promo shot here and there, but your head will be angled just right. Because the band knows that Nikki Six is on the mend. This guy's just temporary. It sounds far-fetched, and it may be. It absolutely may be. This may be a guy who had a mental issue, who was able to grift people all around got matching tattoos, believed this delusion, and made other people believe the delusion. That's definitely possible. But when you're this close to breaking into the mainstream, when you've sacrificed everything to become a successful and famous musician, would you let car accident and a little bit of heroin derail that? What would you do to make sure this success continued? You may not abandon your friend permanently, but you definitely would not abandon your dreams. And if Matthew was telling the truth, then they did it and they got away with it. I think that he may have been in that band, but I don't think he wrote that music, just based on the articles that I read. I think they it's possible that he was a body double and that he played bass, and that might have been it. I think it's an interesting look at it, because a lot of times we hear about body doubles in Hollywood. It's really easy to dismiss them, because they're taking photos of different ages and stuff like that. Here's a time where the body double spoke out and said, 
This was the truth, and people believed him, sometimes. He may not have died a rock star, but he died a rock legend. He is a myth that has lived on far longer than his mortal body. And what more could a rock god ask for? DeadRabbitRadio at gmail.com is going to be our email address. You can also hit us up at facebook.com slash deadrabbitradio. Twitter is at deadrabbitradio. Dead Rabbit Radio is the daily paranormal conspiracy and true crime podcast. You don't have to listen to it every day, but I'm glad you guys listened to it today. Have a great weekend. I'll see you Monday.